Well, hello and welcome back to The Mindset Mentor. I'm your host, Tanya Kolar, helping you to strengthen, condition your mindset so that you can live your best life. Now, one of the things that really sort of stands in the way of us living our best life is when we are not physically or emotionally healthy. So today we're going to talk about how you can activate your super conscious so that you can really truly create a life that you love, that feels good, that feels healthy. And we're going to really um, delve into some topics that are, you know, not mainstream. And my guest on today's show, I'm so excited to welcome back, is Dr. Mark Mancola, who is um, really, you know, walking the edges of conventional medicine and traditional therapies and really helping people to to access their own internal power to heal the body and the mind. Um, you know, he's written his latest book. He's a multiple-time author, uh, seven international best-selling books, and his latest book is called The Way of Miracles. I just want to grab it here so you can see it. Accessing the Superconscious, and it's incredible, uh, not only only is uh, the book phenomenal. There is a documentary of the same title, both award winners, recent uh, winners of the Nautilus Award, which is a very prestigious award in the industry. And uh, yeah, he knocked it out of the ballpark. So we're going to delve deeper into the way of miracles. I had the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Mancola a little while back when the book first came out and the documentary. And, you know, there's been some incredible uh, new material that he has, you know, come up with to to really help access the super conscious. So how about we just de- just jump right in and say hello and welcome back to Dr. Mark Mancola. It is such a pleasure having you back on the Mindset Mentor. Tanya, it's an honor to be back. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. So, you know, it's... Um, uh, you have been so instrumental in healing through your your patients over you know sixty thousand patients over through over three decades and uh, you know what I found truly remarkable is your authenticity and your genuine care for and compassion for for your um, patients and wanting them to get better and to access their own internal uh, healing powers so I, I really truly respect you and I admire your mission greatly. And before we get into how to actually, um, you know, create miracles and healing, I want to talk about what is illness? You know, how, how does illness come to be and manifest in the body? And how does that connect to, uh, you know, karma? Because you talk a little bit about that. So I'm really fascinated by this. Right, first of all, I'll begin by saying that sickness, illness, disease is the perfect, the perfect holism. So people are always shocked when they hear that. Healing isn't the holism. Disease is the holism. It's a priori. You have to have a problem before you can try to find a solution. Mm. So you're chasing the problem, which is leading you through the process. That's the disease. So it doesn't start with healing. Healing isn't the original holism. Disease is. So the objective is to understand that disease is a natural a priori process. So if I eat the sugar, then I'm going to get a toothache. If I, if I eat the weed, I'm going to get a headache. I mean, if then. So it's, it's a priori. But the process of disease is the perfect holism because it actually manifests in an, in an if-then proposition. So, so nature set this the set of rules aside called the way of things, like the Dallas referred to as the way of things. So there's this perfect way of things, the unseen perfect way of things. But the objective is to tap into the fact that it's unseen, but it's always it's always flowing, it's always moving. You can feel it, you can sense it like a like a person in the next room. Mm. So wherever you go in, in your day-to-day life, you're gonna feel the energy of the way of things, showing its presence everywhere. In the darkness and the light and the wind and the rain, it's, gonna, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. So to, to really tap into this, this concept that holism, the perfect holism is disease. And then we chase it, try to correct it, try to rebound in a different direction by creating holistic principles and holistic protocols and things like that to try to make it better. But the process is initiated and the process, and, and theoretically, you, the process of healing begins with disease. And the yeah, process well, of disease, yeah. the process of disease begins with the uh, the a priori holism, you know, the way of things. If you if you violate the way of things, or if you're not in flow with the way of things, they get rough. It gets it gets difficult, and you, then then the, the path that you chart out to correct it has to be really good. It has to be very accurate. It has to be very. It has to to tap into the way of things. 
Mm-hmm. So that's why I say our, our healing systems, are, the weaving of are so, that's why they work so well. They're so important because they're all based on the idea that there is a way of things, first and foremost, and that disease, as you, as you asked, Martin asked me a minute ago, is brought about by the process of violating, either consciously or unconsciously, the way of things. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, you have to, like I said, you have to chase it down by, by, Rooting your system, rooting it. You have to root into it. Where's the root? Where's the root of the problem? Where, in other words, let's go back to the toothache thing. If if you eat too much sugar, you get a toothache, and that roots in the gallbladder. So you get this whole process of rooting emotionally. That's impersonate the sugar because they are emotionally stressed. They have they're having problems with their spouse or whatever. So they eat sugar, and the sugar causes a toothache, and the toothache is actually referred back to gallbladder. So there's always just, you track down all these roots. And if you want to rever- reverse the process and be fairly good, you want to be reasonably good at holism, you want to, you, you can only hope to be as good as disease. Wow. That's so profound, you know, so fascinating, um, you know, in, in how you present that. Now, of course, everything has, you know, a cause and effect. So it's exactly that, you know, when we make certain actions, when we create certain thoughts, that creates a different physiology in the body and the whole, you know, it, makeup of our being uh, you talk about how um you know illness is energy and really everything is energy so you know what's what's behind the energetics of of illness and how can we how can we um actively change that and alter the energy the frequency around us well we talk about super consciousness which is to me the input of the soul mm. so we have deeper levels of consciousness we have a soul, which I don't think, I shouldn't say we have a soul. We are a soul. Mm. We have we have a body. So to start with, we're a soul that has a body. And I think the key is to understand that souls, I say souls are not sedentary. So we tend to think of our soul as just this big essence of energy that's just always steady and somewhere, stable. Like yeah. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere in the ethos. You know, yeah. just, this beautiful thing called a soul. I wonder what it looks like. I wonder what it's doing right now. We don't, they don't, we don't attribute, um, Action, activity. We don't. We don't attribute working. It's not a working entity to us. You know? But I say we need to change that. The soul is a working entity. The soul is a working entity. It's not sedentary. As many spiritual responsibilities. I, I say, for example, it purifies the mind, um, converts lessons into blessings, mm. empowers intention. Intention. Those are all really important parts of the soul. Responsibilities of the soul. So when you talk about healing disease. And where does disease comes from? Disease, like I said, comes from a violation of the way of things. The soul is the way of things. The soul is perfectly in harmony. The soul is not capable of getting out of step. It's in lockstep with the way of things. Mm-hmm. So when you when you want to solve the healing problem, and what we talk about in the book, the way of miracles, you can perform miracles. You, you, you don't think you can. You know, you're 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 doubtful about it. You don't have a positive feeling about it if you're the average American. That's because you're you you're still not clear about who you are. There's an identity crisis. So healing begins with healing begins with correcting the identity crisis. That's where it begins. Yeah. You understand that you, are, you are a soul and souls are not limited. There's no, there's no limitations. A soul. If you're, if you're identifying with yourself as an ego, material self, purely physical, um, that physical self is, it's got a lot of limitations, a lot of endless limitations. The soul has none, none. So to begin with, if you want to, if you want to perform miracles, you have to go where the miracles are, are, are at. They're at the soul level. And they're at the soul level. So that's really interesting because, you know, you talk about how, um, you know, the the soul, um, you know, is not sedentary, right? And some people believe like the soul exists over here somewhere. And so I think the same concept uh, for miracles. It's out there somewhere else and we can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't control it. Um, but there is a way, as you, you know, so beautifully outline in the book is that we can create our own miracles and miracles happen all the time. It's a, it's a natural part of life. And in fact, you know, when they're not happening, that's more of a problem, <laughs> right? If we're not happening, I think that's a good uh, precursor to say, Hey, something's not right. Whether it's, you know, the mental thought pattern uh, or we're just not thinking clearly, whatever it is, you know, we have the ability to, to create those miracles. And I would love to sort of um, also touch on something that you had mentioned you talked about intention um, and, 
you know, attention is so key. I think sometimes we unintentionally intention <laughs> to be a victim um, and we and we create some of those negative thought patterns that lead to disharmony and dis-ease in the body, which of course leads to, you know, illness and sometimes life-threatening, you know, illnesses and disease. But um, how do we how do we create an intention to foster miracles in our life and to be open to receiving healing or to tapping into that frequency of accessing healing? I, I prefer to think of it as be you got to be where the miracles are. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if you want if you want to you want to you want to catch catch the bluefish here in the Massachusetts area, you got to go where the bluefish are. The bluefish <laughs> are in certain, certain areas out there. And if you know where to go, you can get a lot of bluefish. Yes. You know, fish, yes. You know? So I think the objective is the same here. If you want to fish for miracles, uh, you got to go where they are. They're, they're, only, they're not swimming in the places where most people are hanging out. Mm-hmm. Yes. Most people are hanging out in places like ego and personality and phys- physiology and stuff like that. They're not there. No miracles there. Sorry. <laughs> You're fishing in the wrong place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it's not that that big of a shift, is it? I mean, it it almost, no, not it, at all. yeah, because I mean, it sounds like it could be such a massive and it is such a massive shift, but really it's, it's, it's quite easy. And then, you know, this, the miracles just start to flow in life. And I think that the most important part of this, like you said, the soul is not sedentary. It's active. It's very active. Mm-hmm. So to, 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 to create miracles, or to, to be in the field. I like to use the word field. Be in yeah. the field where miracles can manifest. In the field where they're active. And it's like the water where the fish are. You know, that same story. So I think you go to the field where the energy is. And that, that energy is so powerful. It's like you've been in deep meditation before. Everything feels different. Everything is very, very different. The quality of the energy is very different. Mm-hmm. But the soul, the super conscious soul, is capable of breaking through those limitations and projecting itself into a new form, into a new formless form mm-hmm. and i think that the key there is that, that I, I'm really interesting there's three urban studies back in the, the 2007 2010 was the first one there's most recently 2017 three urban studies that they found that there's a direct corollary between meditation increase the increase in the population meditating and a decrease in the crime in those areas there are three different urban studies where they actually showed that a one percent increase in meditation equal to 30%, you know, 28.4% to be exact, 28.4% reduction in crime. Wow. The direct corollary between meditation mm-hmm. going up and crime going down. Wow. And now was very this, solid. Was it, yeah. Was this collective meditation or individual? Like, was it people collective? In, in, collective. collective. Yeah. 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 Wow. But, I mean, it, 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 it just, it underscores the point. Mm-hmm. And it did beautifully too. It beautifully underscores the point that, that the soul is, again, it's active. It's, 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 it's a working entity, as I like to say. Mm-hmm. It's busy, and I think the more you, the more, and the more you think about it that way, the better your, your life will be. Yeah, and I, I mean, think most people, most, most people just think they're, they're like you, you wonder what, how, how you're getting, pro- making progress in your life. You're getting your, your dreams coming true, your things coming going well, your business good, your relationships good, all that. Nobody thinks about the soul's involvement in that stuff. The soul's just a big blob that's floating around somewhere in space. Right. I say you need to put your soul to work. Mm. I think, would you rather, would you rather, would you rather accomplish what your soul can put forth or what your ego can put forth? You pick it. That's an easy pick. Yeah, no kidding. I think we get so locked into controlling the situation and the circumstances, but there's certainly a a perfect divine order um, that existed before we came onto this planet and will exist when we're gone. So I think it's important to trust in what we cannot see uh, with a physical eye, but what we can feel. And, you know, you talked about, you know, that that soul and, you know, the knowledge that the soul has. And, you know, we always know when we're there, when we're feeling that perfection, um, at the place, the space where miracles are, you know, created, where, they're, where they are. We want to spend more time there. But when we're there, we certainly know we're there. We may not be able to figure out exactly or pinpoint exactly what it is, how we got there. But when you're there, you just have this innate knowing. And that's exactly exactly it the soul just knows everything um it's so it's so uh you know mysterious and so profound but um you know provides the the next steps needed the next steps needed in healing or guidance or whatever it is i I, you know we all hold the answers within and it's so important to you know start to challenge the 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 limited thinking that we have um which certainly stems from our you know our realities 
our upbringing, our you know societal and cultural uh, journeys, and we get locked right. into a fixed yeah a fixed set of mindset and beliefs, and, and which is makes up our identity. So let's t- talk a little bit more about that. Um, you know the identity crisis that so many people right now are stuck in, and I think in particular at this time where we have so much turmoil happening in the world, um, injustices, so to speak, um, and even the pandemic that we've experienced collectively, uh, some of the racial injustices that are going on, the wars that have been taking place and continue to take place. Um, you know, how do we try to find the, the true identity when all this crisis is around us? Um, the political toxicity has created a false reality of, of separation. Mm-hmm. That's number one. If we want to be powerful miracle makers, we must dedicate ourselves to the concept of oneness or unification. I think that separation is, is the great illusion. Se- separation is a great illusion. I mean, nothing is separated. Everything is unified. And we, again, the same, same identity crisis. We're used to thinking from our, from our egos, from our material self, from our mortal self. We're so used to programming our lives, our, our, our paths and our footsteps from the mortal perspective. I think we need to, we need to dare to discover who we are immortally. And to, and to think about, you know, every, every, it's incredible. So many people are so interested in, in, in unlimited living, limitless living, but nobody's talking about the soul. It's like they're, they're trying to convince me that I can get there through my ego and I can't. Mm-hmm. But I think, mm-hmm. you know, we, we need to, one of the most important things we need to do is to understand that, that unification is the truth. Unification is the truth. Beautifully said. And, um, you know, I think that when we look at, instances in in our lives you know where things haven't gone smoothly and where we're really sort of you know in a chaotic state we can see the lack of unity um you know certainly come to life and uh, i think it's a really great motivator to to recognize and, and maintain that that the belief or, or the knowing you know that we are all a part of everything and uh you know i think people will get along much better <laughs> and have more compassion for each other in the those cases now we, themselves. Yeah. yes yes oh and it's so important to have that right for yourself but we're going to take a quick break here on the mindset mentor we're going to pick up the conversation where we left off uh that was dr mark mancola multiple time author and also uh a producer um, or a creator, I should say, of The Way of Miracles documentary film. And this is his latest book, The Way of Miracles, act- accessing, I was going to say activating, but we're going to help you activate. Uh, so this is accessing the super conscious. And this is the place where miracles happen. So I know you want to make sure that you come back and listen to where those miracles are for you. Stay tuned. We'll be back here on Saga 960. Well, hello and welcome back to the Mindset Mentor. I'm Tanya Kolar. Here on Saga 960, we are helping you activate your super conscious. So so what is the super conscious? Well, that is the space where miracles happen. Dr. Mancola is my special guest and uh, he's returning here on the Mindset Mentor because one show was just not enough to delve into his incredible book, The Way of Miracles, um, Accessing the Super Conscious, and also the documentary film of the same title which is brilliant it is a beautiful journey of uh you know the decades that mark has spent working with patients to help them access their own healing uh patients who were given terminal diagnoses and uh conventional medicine gave up on them and he was able to transform uh their their health through nutritional therapy Uh, he talks about food being a drug which we'll delve into a little bit uh, later, but, you know, it's important to know that we do have the ability to activate self-healing, and the master Dr. Mancola is here to, you know, share his tips and techniques, and and really, um, you know, I think give us the hope. Hope is so important in our own healing, and I'll quickly just, uh, you know, well, let's just say hello and welcome back to Dr. Mancola. Mark, it's always an absolute pleasure to have you here, and I'm so excited to, you know, get right back into this conversation. Um, But I I wanted to share a a quick story about a friend of mine who just went through um, a double aneurysm. 
and you know this this relates to hope so she had a double aneurysm was told that she had a two to ten percent chance of survival um, and you know if she were to survive that uh, you know the effects she could be paralyzed she could have an issue with her speech there was a lot of complications right so the her doctor um, first doctor told her that, you know, you better get a will in order, asked her questions about the age of her kids and who's going to feed her kids when she's not there and, you know, asked her to get her, her will in order uh, and, and all this. So, of course, she's terrified, right? Uh, and then for whatever reason, there was another doctor that she was sort of, you know, passed to. And when he came to meet with her and went through her information and he, he came back in and she, she told me that he pat the top of her head and he said to her, don't worry. He goes, we have options. And I thought, wow, you know, what a difference in, in the, the, um, the belief structures that can happen when you tell a patient that they're going to die, uh, or that they actually have hope, even though it's such a slim two to 10% chance, but it's all in the delivery, right? Now the first doctor, of course, he's, listen, he's doing his job. I'm not criticizing him for that. And should she have a will in order as a precaution? Yes, absolutely. But I think you can deliver that information and offer hope to the the patient because that's I think where the miracles happen and that's one of the things that I value greatly about the work that you're doing Dr. Bencola is that you always you know approach it with incredible hope optimism and compassion in 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 the sense of healing I think that's important I think you know the, the position in the hand of the physician lies the the difference between life and death, the medicine is coming from the physician. So, I mean, if the, in the hand of the physician is, is, is on the patient, if the physician's hand is on the patient, transmitting warmth and love and care and hope and all that mm -hmm. beautiful stuff, I think mm -hmm. that's going to make all the difference in the world. I think that the hand of the physician is withdrawn mm -hmm. and the physician is just cold and robotic. Yeah. There's no, there's no, there's no healing qualities there. And I think he, it's, the word healing is different than the word, the word doctoring. I think doctoring is, is a little bit more of a, it's more of an empirical thing. And I think healing is the key. Mm, beautiful. Uh, yeah. And by the way, I should just add on to, to, to my story is that my friend um, has completely recovered from her surgeries. She had a couple of surgeries um, and she has full mobility and no complications and she's thriving. And I just thought, wow, so incredible. And what an inspiration to know that we also have that ability to be able to foster that kind of healing for ourselves. And, you know, you got to be, uh, I think, a, a, an advocate in your own health and and recognize that listen you know you're going to uh do what you can right to foster that that internal healing whether you know and try to try to i think shut out some of that external noise of what other yeah. people think we should do i think the word healing it's, words have words have um like in the world in the world of neuroplasticity mm -hmm. words have words have more than meaning they have energy Words have energy. People say, people always say words have meaning. Words have meaning, sure, but their their biggest meaning is their energy. And then nobody knows how to keep track of that stuff. That's that's another world. But words have powerful energy, and you know the word healing has a very remarkably powerful energy mm -hmm. in and of itself. I mean, it has the ability to to invoke what it says just by being mentioned. There's not many words that are like that. Wow. And the word do and the word doctor is is a different quality. It has a different vibration a different energy a different mm -hmm. frequency mm -hmm. so i think that uh, the doctor has to prove himself as being elevated in frequency you know they, they don't automatically get that <laughs> they, have to, they have to prove it doesn't come with the degree, right? Yeah, exactly. No, it doesn't come with the degree, not at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, speaking of that, you know, the words are energy. I mean, there's that that study done with water, I believe, you know, Dr. Emoto. Emoto, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the, you know, such a poignant point to that, that the words carry energy. Um, and, you know, you can analyze the water to see that, you know, the crystallization of the water, water molecules, right? Um, and that they Absolutely. looked beautiful versus looking terrible when you create that negativity. And I think it's like we know that because when we when we say things that we know are not great um, or we say things that are intentionally hurt someone, hopefully we don't, but if we do, uh, if we say something or we, we do something that is not in, a, in alignment with our true authentic core, it doesn't feel good, does it, right? So there's that energy that we feel. It's like, oh, this is bad. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah.
So really fascinating. So, you know, let, let's delve a little bit into um, s- more of uh, the purification. Can we talk about purification and, yeah. you know, how, yeah. to, how to really help to purify some of the, the illness that we're going through? Well, because, because we're, we're, we live in a duality. Mm-hmm. We're, we're dualistic. We have a material, we have an immaterial stuff. We have an um, essence that is soulful, as we've been talking about here. We also have a deeper, more material essence that is that is more physiological, cellular. And I think that being that we're such a distinctly unique dichotomy like that, it's important to understand that we're coming from one place or the other, usually, not not one place and the other. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of what we've learned, a lot, a lot of what we've learned in our in our inculcation processes as young kids and stuff is we've, we've learned to take care of the body. We've learned, to, we've learned to think in terms of the identity being the body, the physical form. And we, we, we tend not to tap into that stuff. People go to, go, go to church services on Sundays and things like that, and, and the, the, there's different words that come out. And nobody's paying attention. I mean, no, nobody gets it. There's, there's no there's, – there's no, so many people have a hard time connecting with those, those, those words because it's the only time they hear them in the course of the week. They, they, the rest of the week, nobody talks about that stuff. So I think that in, in truth, the, the, the unlimited power that we were trying to access to heal and to, to produce, produce miracles comes from the perspective of somebody that's taken the time to recommit themselves to, to reality, to recommit themselves to establishing a reality that has an identity that's very different. Mm. You know, again, you're either a body with a soul or a soul of the body. And I think I've switched over the train tracks. I, I'm a soul of the body. I'm trying to get used to that. It's t- I've been working on it for years. And I'm still getting used to it, you know, <laughs> because it's been so yeah. so inculcated in the other the other direction. It's, it just runs deep. It runs so deep. It's hard to hard to turn our back on that. Yeah, I think well, I think we must. I think we must. Yeah, and a lot of it's it is ancestral, right? It's uh, the collective sure it the collective consciousness. Um, so it is hard to sort of you know break away from that but it is so worthy and important to do that as you say you know it can take a little bit of work but boy are the rewards ever so gratifying is you can't even put into words you know how incredible the impact is when you can get beyond that beyond what we believe to be true about our uh, ourselves believe to be true about our health believe to be true about our limitations you know and, and I know you know from personal experience as well listen I was I was chock full of limiting beliefs and you know it wasn't an overnight process, you know, that I decided to, to get rid of them, you know, you, you it, I mean, it took some work for sure, but it was incredible. You know, the, uh, my life completely transformed when I was able to break from the chains and the decay of my negative thoughts and beliefs about the self. And I know that in your book, um, you know, the way of miracles, you talk about self care and you talk about the importance of that. Um, so can you share a little bit about self care and some techniques? that can help us to, again, remember who we are. You know, I loved what you said uh, about dare to discover who we are. Yes. Well, there's, there's a really important section or two in there about that. And one section that always comes to mind is the fact that um, when, when we're children, there's a point at which we're, we're purely innocent, purely innocent. I mean, who knows where that stops, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, whatever. But the, our early childhood, we're, we're innocent. And there's nothing more deserving than innocence. Nothing is more deserving than innocence. Nothing. So we're both innocent and deserving. And then, then, then the trail we take takes a whole different direction. So we, we lose the innocence and deservedness. Mm. I think it's really important to, to resume a different track from the soul, like I said earlier, so not from the ego. Because, I mean, if you look at yourself from the ego perspective, you're not going to like who you're looking at. Mm-hmm. Because it's imperfect. It's, it's flawed. It's, it's not going to be easy to embrace. Mm-hmm. If, but if you look from the soul, at the soul, you see you never lost the innocence and deservedness that the world talked you out of. You never yeah. lost it. Yeah. It's still there. It's still there. It's still, it's still rich, richly in, imbued there. It's still, still plenty of, of, of for you to, to swim in. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing I think is really important is a section in the book where I t- teach people how to get to that place. I say there's a 10-minute exercise. Go to the nearest mirror mm. and look eyeball to eyeball. The... the Dead center, the nucleus of your eye. Look, look at the nucleus of your eyes and don't take your eyes off your eyes for 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you're looking at your own eyes in the mirror for 10 minutes straight, non, non, uninterrupted, not disturbed. And at the end of that 10 minutes, you'll feel the essence of your presence is what I say. And that, that's your soul, the essence of your presence. That's just a reminder to, to help you cultivate a connection point 
to who you are or what you really are. Yeah, it's a separating, you know, just the, the human body, right, for a moment, just getting and stepping aside and becoming the observer, um, you know, and again, finding that feeling of of just joy and bliss and wholeness. And, and I think so many of us feel fragmented. We're fragmented through our sure, sure. realities, right, in life and getting caught up in the, in the competition and um, having to do, you know, we always believe that we have to do more, be more in order to be able to have a fulfilling life and it's almost like you actually have to go the opposite direction and do less and actually get to that place of stillness you also talk about um you know stillness and and um i can't remember exactly what you said but you you uh, oh i think you you said that stillness is the key to miracles yes because stillness stillness has an eternal quality to it so i i, I always bring in bring in the duality of um, the moment. Everybody's always talking about the moment, the importance of the moment. And is the moment is important, no question about it. The power now. That's 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 so powerful. But I say it's important. Everything in Taoist philosophy is dual dualistic. Everything's dualistic. Mm -hmm. So what is the what is the dual opposite of now? Nobody's taking the time to do that. I say it's eternity. Ah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. So yes, I think when you when yeah. you when you're when you're in between the polarities of now and eternal in the eternal eternal nature, you know, eternity. I think that, that then you're in a place that you have no limitations. If you have a place called now, in a way, you're still subject to limitation. If you have now versus eternity, you have no limits. Yeah, the clarity I love that. Is so, so limitless. Well, it's so interesting, right? Because, you know, we always talk about the the past and the and uh, the future, right? And how important it is to be in the now. But then, yeah, when you realize eternity, you know, that's different than actually, you know, living in the future because eternity, I guess, is in the now. But it, like, it's almost like a bigger version of the now, this expansive. Eternity, eternity is, is the now that never, never stops. Yes, yes. Wow, that's so beautifully said. Um, so we can expand that um you know to to really help us in our day-to-day -day lives I and mean, we're obviously living in this planet and having to interact with people and things happen and people you know push our buttons and we all have triggers we all have ego our ego gets activated but it doesn't have to end there when we can start to realize that well hold on a second i can take back control of the mind i can shift i can come back to the stillness i can access and activate the super conscious to create a reality that starts to serve you know uh, and is in an alignment with what you know we truly are and and our and our, our beings um and you talked about um parenting the the so self nice. yes let's talk about that that's fascinating mm -hmm. well, i mean i i just i i believe we spend so much time blaming in our culture and blaming keeps our growth from happening blaming stunts your growth it doesn't add to it, it doesn't support yeah. it at all yeah so there's a lot of people that blame their parents yeah and some parents are pretty tough and, and don't they, they don't deserve some some don't deserve the, the criticism others others surely do yeah but the bigger the bigger point of it all is i believe in between lifetimes in between lifetimes we choose our parents mm -hmm. not for what they can do but for what they can't do because what they it's what they can't do that helps us define what we must do for ourselves as parents oh okay that's beautifully said okay so we choose them for what they can't do for us oh so good okay so expand a little bit more on that that changes the whole game. <laughs> it's kind of like saying <laughs> it. It, it, because it takes the whole criticism thing out of, out of context. It's, it's crazy to criticize that. that, that they're, they're part of the solution by being the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. I was just listening to something um, last night and it was about kids, young children who um, have remembered actually choosing their parents and they come in with this knowledge that they wouldn't have had or they certainly didn't get from their surroundings um, that perplexes their their parents of course they start to believe that wow they actually did choose like i mean some have uh remembered wars and they're too young to even know what a war actually is um they uh and one one child remembered he said that he followed his mother her the foot he, the footsteps he followed her footsteps in the snow and they didn't live 
in an area where there was snow. He'd never seen snow, didn't know what snow was. And so how could he remember that? So there is that, you know, remembering of, you know, the in-between life, life state or the, or, or past lives or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, I do agree with you that I believe that we choose our parents and I believe that we have lessons that we are, you know, working on and we're here to figure it out. And, you know, we're not impervious to adversity. <laughs> we're going to face that as humans and and but if we find the lessons uh, and the blessings and something that you talk about as well, the lessons and the blessings, I think that's so important. You know, and from, from my own journey, I mean, I've, I've, I've experienced, you know, trauma, you know, PTSD, what, what, you know, what have you. And I, as you know, Dr. Mercola, um, I was recently, um, you know, experiencing breast cancer and, and you certainly helped me, you know, through, through my journey. But I realized that immediately I decided I'm going to get the gift. I'm going to find the gift and the blessing in this moment. I'm not going to wait 10 years. I'm not going to wait 20 20 years to figure it out. So I welcome it in and I say, thank you for the, the lesson. Thank you for the blessing. And I can go forward in a way that now I'm empowered to help other people in a way that I never would have been able to, to help them. And, you know, you got to be okay with what shows up, but know that, yes, it is for your greater good. And there's a blessing in all of our challenges. Yes. And I think the other thing I think is important to mention with this conversation, part of the conversation is to think in terms of even in the chaos, there's order. Yeah. The, the order never stops. It's always order. Even the chaos is part of the order. Mm. So I think we tend to we, we tend to think qualitatively about spiritual things. It doesn't add up, doesn't, doesn't work that way. You need to think qualitatively about material things, not spiritual things. I mean, qualitatively, you're saying you're you're you're, you're rating things. It's good when it's good when things are smooth and I feel good and it's bad when they're bad. It doesn't work that way. And the tai, I always bring up the Tai Chi circle, the yin yang sign. Yep. You've got dark and light making a perfect so perfect circle. If you separate them, if you want to focus on the light, 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 you have a semicircle. You have a halfism, not a holism. Ah. I think the important point there is you want to you want to embrace the holism. You embrace the holism, you have to realize that there is a divine wisdom that actually presides over all this stuff. And the divine wisdom actually saw that we need to have the dark and the light interposed. And that's exactly what we are. And I think for us to not see that is we're, we're missing the boat. We need to we need to educate ourselves spiritually and to, and to tap into the fact that even in the chaos, there's order. Yeah. And, you know, you have to have that opposite to understand what the, what the gift is. Like you, yeah. you can't walk around being in a bliss state all the time, every minute of the day, because no. if you didn't know the opposite, how would you understand what bliss actually is? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 there's a every painting has a canvas. I think that the painting wouldn't be a painting without the canvas. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So true. Um, it's the backdrop, you know, for everything, right? It's the soul, the, the super conscious and uh, we, we, we create. So when you take away, you know, the colors on the canvas, right? If you take away the paint, it's, the canvas is still there. It's still intact. You're, you're absolutely right. Now we can color it and add the layers, but underneath that canvas is there. So that is like the soul, right? That that ever uh, present soul um, that is there to guide you, to help you, and just to just to be it, to be there. It's it just simply is, and I think it's so important to embrace that. Uh, we're gonna take another break right here on Saga 960. I'm Tanya Kolar. You're listening to the Mindset Mentor, and my special guest today. Today is Dr. Mark Mincola, uh, multi-author, best-selling author. He is, uh, you know, a speaker. You've you've probably seen him on Dr. Oz or many of the uh, shows and radio shows or TV shows that he has been on, uh, sharing his wisdom, knowledge, and expertise when it comes to energy healing, quantum energy healing. He uses uh, a very customized, holistic approach to healing his patients. He's worked with over sixty thousand patients throughout. Uh, uh, you know, over th three decades. So a lot of a lot of wisdom that we're here to share and listen to today with Dr. Mincola. So stay with us and we will be back right here on Saga 960. 
Hello, hello, and happy Thursday. I hope you're having a phenomenal day. And if it's not so phenomenal, let's shift your mindset and get it to a place where you're going to absolutely enjoy your day because we are not controlled by our external circumstances unless, of course, we choose to let that, that happen. We always have free will. So let's, let's really harness the power of the mind and access our super conscious to create the life that we love. So today, we are focusing on The Way of Miracles, a beautiful book and documentary film by Dr. Mark Mancola, who is a quantum energy healer. He's a multi-time best-selling author. Uh, he's worked with over 60,000 patients, helping them to completely transform uh, you know, their, their health. And in fact, many the documentary tracks several of Dr. Mancola's patients who were given terminal illnesses and, and where conventional medicine gave up on them. And he was able to, you know, create a customized approach to healing to allow them to, to, you know, live a life where they are, you know, disease free, right? So no more disease in the body, they're thriving. And some of these patients, you know, decades later, you know, you see the progression that they are doing incredibly well. And where at one point, you know, there was almost no hope for them. So there is always hope. If you're listening right now, there is hope for you. I don't want you to ever give up on any place that you're at in your life. And we're not just talking about, um, you know, our health that can come in many different, you know, areas in our lives. So there is always hope for you. And I'm so excited to continue the conversation with Dr. Mark Mancola, who is, uh, you know, on a mission to help the planet to heal. Um, and so, so, so wonderful to continue these conversations with you, Mark. I think, uh, you know, we always have a lot to talk about and there's a lot of wisdom there. And I think people... Um, really need to sort of be proactive in their own health and start to maybe challenge some of the, the uh, you know, mainstream thinking when it comes to allopathic medicine. No question about it. I think that the people are, people are starting to do. There are pockets of people showing up in the country that have, well, I think the film has helped a lot of people. I've, had, I've gotten thousands of letters and things from emails from people from all around the world. Yes. But they've seen the film. Yes. The film's in 158 countries, so a lot of people have wow. seen it. And, and, and award-winning, by the way. Yes. Mm -hmm. we, Congratulations. Silver, silver medal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> wow. So, so the film is, a, it's, it's, it's inspiring people. It's educating people. It's turning them on to the, the other possibility and, and to the limitless possibilities. It's, it's been really beautiful in that, that regard. Um, but I think that the world is, is awakening slowly. It's a little reluctant. It's a little afraid. It's, it's a slow wake-up process, but I think it's, it's inevitable. I mean, you, you can only see so many beautiful miracle stories where you start wondering where your, where your miracles are. Mm, yeah. So I remember reading uh, in A Course in Miracles, you know, talking about miracles are like, you know, they happen every day. And when they're not happening, you know, that's, th that's the problem. Right. Um, so they're all, and I think that that's, we, we, we really truly feel the opposite that, oh, if we experience a miracle, it's only maybe like once in a lifetime. Right. But that's, that's part of the limitation process. You know, you're not going to see what you don't believe you can see. Mm. So I think, you know, believing is seeing, as they say. Yeah. So I think so I think that's an important part of the equation. I also think that it's important we we think in terms of um, the, the the duality that we've been speaking about. I think everything is based on duality. So it's like there's there's heightened consciousness, and then there's 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 dull consciousness. And I think that there's frequencies that we, we can produce energetically that actually make us more, more susceptible to falling prey to not being in the, in the miracle game at all. And by the same token, there's, there's frequencies and vibrations that we can tap into, you know, with certain meditations, certain prayers, things like that. And it's been most, I think 90, 90% is belief, just belief system. It's, it's cultivating a belief. That's important. Cultivating a belief system. Mm -hmm. Meditation is important. Prayer is important. But cultivating the belief system is really key. And to, and to turn away the doubt, to turn away the, the limitation and to not accept the limitation and doubt, to, to just bring in the, the really powerful energies that I think are part of our more positive duality. I mean, we, we talk all the time about duality. Mm -hmm. I think duality is summarized in an internalistic form by karma and dharma. You know, we, we talk a lot about karma. Karma is, if, you, if you're not, like we said earlier, if you're not, if you're not traveling in, in flow with the way of things, there is there are, there are laws that are unwritten laws like well, like gravity. Mm -hmm. If you violate them, you you end up on the wrong side of the of the game. You know, it's things things don't end up happy. 
So you create your karma. You, you do the wrong thing. You make willful choices to do things that are uh, endangering for other people, uh, abusive to other people, disregarding of other people, any of that stuff at all. That's going to that's gonna bring about karma that's going to be problematic. And karma is going to get even with you. That's kind of like nature's, nature's punishment for, for you missing missing the cues to be um, compassionate and loving and kind and, and, serve, and serving. I think that to serve, to be loving, passionate, and kind produces dharma. Dharma is a different thing altogether. Dharma is like the blessing. So karma is the, is the punishment. Dharma is the blessing. And moksha is liberation. M-O-K-S-H-A, moksha, that's liberation. So you've got, you've got the, the downside, the upside, and then the, the liberation altogether. Yeah, and I think that it's important to recognize that if we are on, you know, maybe the the dark side of that, we're we're in the car the karmic pay, payouts um, that we can get to the dharma and we can get to moksha and experience liberation, right? Because if we yes, yes. we can get a little bit upset that oh my gosh, if I'm experiencing all this karma, I'm stuck. I'm never going to get out of it. But of course we can. Yes, I think the important part there is the soul is a purifier, like we said earlier. If you're operating from the soul, that, that's the game. That's the whole thing is, is super consciousness says we're going to operate from the soul. The soul has purification capabilities, repositioning capabilities. The soul actually will reposition you in your identity. And the soul will actually purify your, your iniquities. So it's, it's, it all comes back to the soul, soulfulness. It all comes back to soulfulness. Yeah, I think soulfulness and also a willingness to get to that soulfulness, right? To get to that sure, place. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, yeah, because I mean, I'm thinking even just like, you know, an example, uh, you know, when you're around people and there's a lot of uh, negative talk about other people, I mean, that never feels good. And when you get stuck in that and, you know, listen, I, I'm not I'm not perfect. I've been there where I kind of will add a little bit and I invariably feel terrible if I say anything negative and I really choose not to uh, by free will to engage in those types of conversations but occasionally I get sucked into that you know the ego takes over and I find myself yeah. saying something and I yeah. feel awful and again it's yeah. a matter of the willingness to say hey okay wait a minute I don't like this feeling let's shift let's move to that something feeling else awful is, that, that feeling awful is part of your purification from your, your karma that's wow. feeling awful is part of your purification that's part of the healing through the process so um, really important to understand now that, that karma is, is is part of everybody's life. Everybody, nobody nobody gets out without karma. Everybody has that same process. So there's, there's a dualistic tension. You know, there's this, this incredible tension. Tension is sacred. That's the most important thing to understand. Tension is sacred. We tend to curse tension. Tension is sacred. Oh. It enables us to propel ourselves forward from karma and dharma. Yeah, interesting, because I think if we look at our life, um, all those hard lessons are usually really beautiful lessons, right? Eventually. <laughs> Not no, necessarily in the moment, but yeah. We can actually choose. I, I, so one of the things I, I talk about in the book, unconditional positivity, unconditional joy. Those are things I write about in the book, and unconditional joy. I mean, it's easy to be joyful when you win the lottery or your best friend's coming to visit you for a couple of days. But I say you want to think in terms of being going out of your way to create an unconditional nature to your joy. So in other words, when things don't work well, you get a flat tire on the way to work and you get your, your dress clothes all dirty and all that stuff. And it's raining and you're a mess when you get to work. It's easy for you to say this, this day was horrible. And this is a bad day folks. But I think it's really the most, the most important time for you to say, to, to try to cultivate that wisdom, that strength in the, in the bigger picture, you know, you're looking at always looking at the bigger picture yeah. saying that this, yeah. I'm not going to let this be part of my, my down situation. I'm, I'm this is going to be, I'm going to be joyous through it. So uh, to practice yeah. joy unconditionally is really powerful. Yeah, I love that. I was just thinking about that. I, you know, when you have that bad day, it's like, you know, the, the start of a, a cool breeze and then the windstorm comes and then the tornado hits and it's just chaos everywhere because you're carrying that, you know, with you where, where you go. Um, so, yeah, really important to, to have that, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, free will and the willingness to to take control and direction of, you know, what you're choosing to focus on and what you're choosing to feel. Um, and you never, know, and never forget that it's an option. Yes, yes. Choice. It's a choice. And you have, uh, uh, actually, there's so many incredible um, exercises and lessons and techniques that you've applied um, for, for the reader um, and the viewer who's watching the documentary of The Way of Miracles, as well as listen, uh, reading the book, is um, for practical ways for them to apply your, your 
you know, tips right away. It's not something that's going to take years to figure out. It's like, wow, I can just spend 10 minutes and do one of the processes. I can literally just visualize, close my eyes for a few minutes and transmute some of the energy. So you have a, a transmutation process as well. And I think was that was that for the uh, karmic energy? Yes, it was. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. And transmutation yeah. takes you above all that stuff. So it's kind of like when you're in the middle of karma, your, your, your energy is not elevated. So the, the transmutation elevates you, pulls you right out of that, that frequency. So by pulling you out, snapping out of that frequency, you clearly, clear, you purify. Yes, purify. Okay, so on the on the uh, note of purification, I want to talk about because we don't have too much time left. I want to talk about um, uh, food um, and healing. So and the correlation. And you talk about food as, as food being a drug. So what do you mean by that? Um, people for, for years have said food is a medicine. I, I don't like that. I like to say food is a drug because drugs can save lives. Drugs can take lives. Oh, yeah. I think that when you think about food, food is it has. I mean. And sometimes it's quite literally, I mean, somebody who's a diabetic eats a lot of ice cream is going to be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sometimes it's quite literal, but I think overall, the objective is to understand that food is a drug and drugs save lives and drugs take, take, can take lives. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it takes it the next level beyond food is medicine. Mm -hmm. Food is much more than medicine. It's more, it's more powerful than that. Absolutely. So can you give us uh, some quick uh, tips on foods that we can, you know, incorporate into our meal plan if it's not in one of the there. most important one of the most important factors you want to keep in, keep in mind if you're dealing with miracle making if you want to be a miracle maker mm -hmm. you must think in terms of inflammation being the, the key problem to so many diseases i mean if the 100 is 150 autoimmune disease 150 autoimmune disease 72 percent of which are caused by inflammation and inflammation begins with food i mean there's three different categories of what are called icosanoid icosanoid hormones in the body Mm -hmm. The second group is called COX-2 hormones, like cosmetic twos. And they're made from, from foods like red meat, dairy products, uh, sugar, uh, fermented foods like yeast, beer, wine, uh, peanuts, peanut butter, all those things. Those, those are COX-2 foods. And those produce arachidonic acid. The arachidonic acid builds con high concentrations of, of um, leukotriene B4 hormones. Leukotriene B4 is the most inflammatory hormones in the body. So too much peanuts, too much peanut butter, too much red, too many steaks, too much glass, too many glasses of milk, the bones are going to start getting weaker and the, and the joints are going to start getting more inflamed. And that's, that's what that's the deal that is. But again, keep in mind, it's more than John, John's bones and joints. It's much bigger than that. It's also a matter of virtually every aspect of life. Inflammation affects every aspect of life. Heart disease is inflammatory. Can cancer is inflammatory. They're all inflammatory. Mm -hmm. So you want to be careful about too much red meat, too many peanuts, too much sugar, too much dairy. I think stay away from those. Oh, I mean, incredible information right there. And, you know, some of the things that you had mentioned, I think um, people ingest because they think it, it uh, is actually helping them. Like you mentioned milk, right? How that's bad for the bones. And, you know, the opposite is what's been sort of told to us, right? So, you know, it really is important to, to you know, pay attention to, um, you know, some of the science behind the food. No, the, and the Harvard, This is a Harvard nurses study. 76,000 women were, were studied in this Harvard mm -hmm. nurses study. Mm -hmm. And if they discovered that those women had the highest consumption of dairy products, had the highest rate of bone fractures. Wow. Wow. So interesting. Um, now, um, our final, uh, you know, point that I that I'd love to talk about, because I think it's so important, is the the uh, the difference between obviously the mind and body, I mean, is correlated. But specifically, if we look at the body, and we talk about the mind versus the heart, and how important it is to focus, you know, and come from a place of the heart versus the mind. I say that the um... It's, 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 it's more of a heart and soul issue, I think. You know, the, I say the idea is that the, the back door of the heart is the front door, the door of the soul. And I think that the heart knows the soul better than the mind. I mean, the mind, the mind, is, the mind is capable of becoming unified with that process. It's capable of being inclusive. It's, it's capable of being a supporter of the, the good flow of divine energy in us. Mm. It's also capable of running, its, running itself in whatever direction it wants to. You know, ego can be... Be, be really profoundly oh aggressive. boy that ego yep mm -hmm. so so it's 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 a matter of understanding that the heart knows the soul best that's the key i think mm -hmm. and to, it's, to ground yourself in the context of heart 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 energy heart energy is the key because it's, it's so trustworthy it's so true it's so real it's so 
It's so uh, believable. It's so powerful. It's so loving. The heart is love. You know, I think love, the love of the heart and the, the purity of the soul make our lives what they are. And I think the mind, if you're fortunate, is, is trained and is, is regulated in ways that actually, and directed, that actually support the beauty of the heart and the soul. Oh, uh, I love that. So, so beautifully said. So I think, uh, yeah, that's one of our goals is to really get uh, the coherence between the mind and the heart so that the soul can be, you know, you know, can can really uh, shine forth and come through, right? So we can sort of get out of our own way and experience the limitless being of our true authentic core soul, that universal soul that is in unity with everything and everyone. Um, and unfortunately, we are out of time. I mean, this went by so quickly. Mark, it is so incredible to have you back and to have had this amazing conversation. I always learned so much, um, you know, from you and and I consider you uh, an incredible teacher, a gift to humanity, and uh, certainly a role model. So please keep doing the incredible work that you are doing to 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 heal the planet and to help so many people. You left one out, a friend. Yes, my good friend. Absolutely. I is what an honor. What an honor, Mark. <laughs> Special being with you. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, my pleasure. All right, everyone. Well, that is a wrap for today's Mindset Mentor. So make sure that you dare to discover the the power of your super conscious because you've got it. It's already there. You just got to get out of your own way. You know, stillness. Remember and listen to what Dr. Mancola said, where stillness is the place of miracles. So let's quiet that lovely chattering uh, ego <laughs> and stillness the mind so that we can access the power of healing and live our best lives. Stay tuned and there's more coming up here on Saga 960.